Good evening to all the SHRs joining SHR at home and the webinar tonight. Might the year 2020 be a blessed and healthy year to you all. Also our colleagues from Sun Parks and all our friends from SHRs, good evening to you all. Welcome to our new members that have just joined the SHR. All the best with becoming full members. Good evening to all the Veldwachters who are here with us today in SHR. Mag 2021 for iedereen elk gezinde en a gezonde jaar wees. Ook een welkom aan onze collega's uit Sant Parken en vrienden van Ile Veldwachters wat bij ons aangesluit het. Welkom aan al onze nieuwe leren wat onlangs aangesluit het, starten met jullie proces om Ile Veldwachters te worden. When our 2021 webinar series tonight kicks off with a talk by lightning pathologist Prof. Ryan Blumenthal, who will be shedding light on lightning. Prof, you may switch on your video now. I can introduce you to our guests for tonight. As a forensic pathologist at the University of Pretoria's Department of Forensic Medicine, Ryan has special interest in injuries caused by lightning and electrocution, a field of study known as keratopathology. While we are all fear the struck of lightning, many people do survive the experience. Why do they survive and what are their stories? Ryan will be sharing with us stories of injury, survival, staying safe in wilderness storms, and the effects of climate change on wilderness medicine. Ryan is best-selling author of his book, Autopsy, Life in the Trenches with a Forensic Pathologist from Africa. While his eight-part documentary, Light Pathning Pathologist, has recently aired on channel 180 of this TV. Hopefully a repeat will be scheduled soon. He has published widely in the fields of electrocution, suicide, and other areas involving the pathology of trauma. His chief mission in life is to help advance forensic pathology services, both nationally and internationally. Your questions to Prof. Ryan tonight should therefore be limited to the effects of lightning on the human and animal body. Enjoy the fascinating talk. Your life might depend on it. Over to you, Prof. Ryan. Thank you, Francois. Is my screen visible? No, not as yet. Um, um, I think you just need to go video on first. Um, let me just... Sure. Just uh, yeah. and now, no, no, not yet. There you go. Your video is on now. I can see you. Right. And you can you see my screen? Now you just need to share the screen. Um, okay, I'm just trying to share the screen now. Yeah. Right in the, there we go, something's happening. All right. All right, you up. Yes. Can everyone see? Yes, the, everyone should be able to see now. Thank you. Right. I'm just, right, so uh, thank you for having me. It's such an honor to be here. I'm uh, going to switch my face off, if that's okay, just to save some some bandwidth. And I'm just going to talk with my screen. Is that all right? Fine. Okay, <clears throat> so I hail from the University of Pretoria, and I did write a book um, which became a bestseller in South Africa. The book is called Autopsy, and it's done quite well. It's sold over about 5,000 copies in South Africa, and it went overseas to Britain last Friday. Um, I've been getting selfies from all over the world, uh, well, from all over South Africa and, and from places in the world. And I must say, um, it has not gone to my head. I'm still very humble, um, but it has been quite overwhelming. I see that my book uh, beat uh, Jordan Peterson's book uh, on the rack, which uh, would have pushed an, an average man into some type of ego situation. But I assure you that my feet are still very firmly on the ground. Um, and then I've got this topic on lightning, which 
sparked uh, an eight-part documentary on people's weather called Lightning Pathologist. And according to Nielsen's um, index, it was seen by some 2.2 million people. So um, it has had quite an exciting effect. And one of my students actually drew this little diagram for me, which is quite sweet of her. So it's been quite an adventure and uh, I've been getting quite a bit of fan mail. The strangest fan mail that I've received to date has been from a CMAX prisoner in handcuffs, in full uniform, sending me a friendship request. So that's my background and that's who will be giving the talk today. <clears throat> So to give a grand round on lightning, I think we need to start off by how to spell it. And I believe this is how um, we spell lightning. Are there any questions so far? Um, am I going too fast for you folks? Is everything up to speed? Um, is everything in order? Peter? Perfect. Thanks, Ryan. All right. So at this speed, I shall persist. And I've got a lot of slides here, but I'm going to move very swiftly through this presentation and just basically pump you folks with data and information. So lightning is our, one of our most prized natural phenomena. It is as beautiful as it is deadly. Um, I got into this for my PhD and it is, it is such a fascinating field because it happens in a millisecond and within that millisecond you have to document and capture and notice so much information in one millisecond. And with that, you must make deductions. So it, it evokes an extreme scientific mindset. Um, and yeah, it's, it's an amazing discipline, which is really, but let, let us take this step by step. Eh? So I wrote a textbook, um, I, I contributed to the lightning chapter in Wilderness Medicine's sixth edition textbook, which is like the gold standard textbook. And I was I also contributed to the seventh edition. And I've given Peter a copy of this chapter. So if any of you folks require a copy of this chapter, it is available via Dropbox. And in it, uh, we think it's the most definitive chapter on lightning medicine on the planet. So you're welcome to that chapter. So through the organizers, I've given this chapter to you folks and a little lightning information booklet for those who want it. I also wrote the lightning and electrocution chapter in this textbook. And I wrote the lightning and electrocution chapter in this textbook. But I assure you, I'm quite humble. Um, I still go to bed at night, brush my teeth. I mean, all this fan mail and all these textbooks I'm still the same old guy that uh, you'll meet at Honorary Ranger meetings. And the strange thing is that Lightning does not read textbooks. So as much as I study it, it, it still continuously blows my mind because there's always some other aspect that you just don't think about. <clears throat> so for example, take a look at this picture. Here is Lightning striking between two telephone poles. You'd think that Lightning would strike a telephone pole, but not so. And also notice the illusionary aspect of lightning here. You don't know how close it is. Is this behind the telephone poles? Is it before the telephone poles? And lightning is actually a three-dimensional spark. So it's actually coming towards you, away from you, towards you, and away from you. And it appears two-dimensional against the horizon. So it's just a fascinating photograph to make you realize that lightning doesn't always strike the highest object. Here is a photo of lightning that went through a curtain, through the window and through a curtain. So um, you think you're safe indoors, not always. Here is lightning striking water, you know, and then why don't fish wash up dead on the beach or whales? And the reason is the lightning flashes over their bodies. There's no potential difference. Otherwise you'd get a lot of whales and fish washing up dead on the beach. So you're quite safe if you're floating in water, but if you're standing in water, that's a different stand a story. So it evokes wonder. Here is a photo actually taken by an Henri Ranger's uh, wife. Um, and she took this photo. And I mean, look how intensely bright that is. And we will get to the damage that lightning can cause to you now, now. But this strike actually knocked her off her feet. 
Um, and she actually started crying after this photograph, apparently. This photo was taken in Pretoria at 8 p.m. at night. But take a good look at this photo. Does anything strike your attention? This was 8 p.m. in Pretoria at night. Take a look at that, at that flash. I don't know if you can see, but there are two birds on the right side of the flash flying at night in the thunderstorm. Peter, can you see those birds? Yeah, we can Peter? see it. We can see yeah, two, two birds flying at night, probably migrating. I don't know what species of birds they were, but this photo was taken 8 p.m. at night, and there it is, <clears throat> a once-in-a-lifetime photograph, and birds flying in the pitch dark. Amazing. So here's some lightning world records. Um, the longest flash in distance was actually 320 kilometers long. It happened in Oklahoma on the 20th of June in 2007. So, I mean, you can imagine, you can get struck without, a, without there being um, thunder clouds. I mean, you can get what's known as bolt out of the blue, 320 kilometers away. That's how long the, the flash was. And the longest duration for a single flash, 7.74 seconds which was measured in southern France in 2012. And they can actually measure all these, this data. So why is lightning important? Um, it's part of the atmospheric nitrogen cycle. It's part of the global electrical circuit. Uh, it's a possible mechanism for the origin of life, and it's very visually attractive. So can it strike the same place twice? Absolutely. If the Empire State Building gets struck multiple times a year, so too the Eiffel Tower. Now, he has, I don't want to bore you folks with uh, too much um, in, uh, technical details tonight. So I just want to give you stuff that you can talk about to tourists at Chukwane or at a campsite, you know, in the, in the, while people are tenting. I want to give you some real world knowledge, practical to save lives. But there's four types of lightning. You get positive lightning, negative lightning, upward lightning, and downward lightning. And 90% of lightning is negative downwards. How do you remember that? Well, 90% of people are negative and down, generally speaking. Lightning is a three-dimensional spark. It's about one-third of it reaches the ground. The other two-thirds are cloud-to-cloud -cloud, um, charges. So one-third of lightning is cloud-to-ground or ground-to-cloud. And most lightning happens in the afternoon, between 3.30 and 6.30 in the afternoon. That's when people are on their hikes, coming back after a walk, etc. It is the most consistent weather killer. It kills more people than tornadoes, floods, etc. And how many people die per year? 24,000 people from lightning per year. And about 240,000 get injured per year. Now, how has COVID affected this? Well, we've now become an indoor species. So um, luckily, uh, lightning death rate has decreased. I mean, we, we're more indoors these days. But uh, when we were, were an outdoor species, um, yeah, th that was the death rate, 24,000 per year. This is what lightning looks like around the world. And as you can see, it's mainly distributed over the equator. And this is um, a very good um, map that shows you how much lightning flashes per square kilometer per year happen on the planet. So in the very... Democratic Republic of Congo, they're having about 232 flashes per square kilometer per year. And in Argentina, about 54 uh, flashes per square kilometer per year. I'll show you what's happening in South Africa now. But we have about, over the entire South Africa, 25 million ground strokes per year. And we have between 65 to 67 thunderstorm days per year. Now, our weather is changing. There is definitely climate change, and we're going to expect longer weather phenomena. I mean, you've seen what's happened over the last two to three weeks now. We've had um, long-lasting weather. So we're going to get more extreme weather. But I'm not a climatologist, please. But um, about a year or two ago, we were having um, in Pretoria between 65 to 67 thunderstorm days per year. And the most lightning in the country happens on the Drakensberg escarpment <clears throat> with about 26 flashes per square kilometer per year. What does this look like? Well, here's the 1994 map. As you can see, nothing's happening in Cape Town. Sorry to the Cape Town region. Um, it's all happening up here uh, in this part of the country, up in the Highveld. And this is what it looks like on the 2006 map. 
every dot is a flash of lightning, even out to sea. So you can see most of the lightning in South Africa, it happens over the escarpment. So what do we get out of this? Most uh, lightning happens in our summer season and between 3.30 and 6.30 in the afternoon. That's when most deaths and injuries happen. So here in Gauteng, we're having about 10 fatalities per year. And um, for every three dead, we can expect seven injured. So we're expecting about 22 to 30 survivors in Gauteng per year. For South Africa entirely, we're expecting 80 deaths per year, and we're expecting about 200 lightning strike survivors per year, 200 to 300. So this was the first case that actually captured the imagination of the South African public. You can read the gravestones. This is on Van Rienen's Pass uh, near the Golden Gate uh, National Park region. But you'll see there's Valerie Wilcox and Johan Bestendig de la Harp. And in my book, um, I describe their full story, but they were 21. It was Johan's 21st birthday, and they were going with a group of 12 people in their wagon, and they had Buddha Biscuit, and um, they, they had Johan's horse there, whose name was Moscow, and they picked up a ladder, and um, you know he was studying agriculture, and I think she was studying medicine at the time, and it was Johan's 21st birthday, and on Monta Sources, um, on the 18th December 1932, um, both Valerie Johan and the horse Moscow were killed by lightning. And this was one of the first cases in South Africa that really captured the imagination of the public. So lightning, um, if there's any physical ge geographers or geologists amongst you, you know that lightning leaves a lot of signs on the ground. And also fascinating is if you're in the bush to look for these kind of things. These are fulgurites. If lightning strikes the sand, you get these tube or bore like structures, very difficult to age. If lightning strikes the ground, you get this ferning or arcing type pattern. Here's lightning on a tree. Um, you can lick your finger and touch that and it's got a slight soot appearance. Here it was from Kruger National Park. This was sent to me very kindly by Ranger Louis Ulefier. I don't know if you can see the signs of the lightning on the tree. Um, there on the right branch, you can see some subtle stripping of bark. And here's more blatant lightning with stripping of bark, also from Kruger National Park. <clears throat> By the way, one week before this lecture, I went on a countrywide hunt down for photos from lightning in our national parks. And there was one particular case that I've heard about many years ago. And within this last week, I managed to track down a singular photo of this incident. This happened in Kruger National Park. Um, I was so excited to get this photo. But basically, um, and I'll show you the photo a bit later in the presentation, but there were 60 buffalo in Silver Fist Dam in the Kruger National Park that were struck and killed by lightning. And I do have a photo of that incident. But it took me months to track down that singular photo. But that, that's coming later. So. So yeah, please just be patient. So lightning causes tremendous structural damage to properties and the short-term insurance industry in South Africa, it's a multi-million rand industry. This, I mean, this was a clubhouse in Johannesburg that was struck by lightning, caused incredible damage to the roof. Um, it, you know, you get these surges, wires can burst through the drywall. Um, the, the roof collapsed, actually, in that uh, singular incident, which was due to the blast wave, which we'll get to later. Surging. Um, best to unplug your equipment during an electrical thunderstorm. Uh, it's the safest. But here you can see even some of the plastering uh, exploded off the wall during the electrical thunderstorm. Even our uh, vineyards are not safe from lightning. This was sent to me very kindly from the professor uh, Gerard uh, Fosnu uh, from uh, Department of Biology at the University of Pretoria. It's his slide and these um, grapes were struck by lightning. So even plants are at risk from lightning outdoors in a thunderstorm. <clears throat> and then the whole herds of animals get wiped out by lightning. This is something from the past, a photo from the past. These cows were under a tree and they got um, killed by lightning. And this uh, film, I was on National Geographic for Tigris Productions. 
Um, this was seen by 21 million people. It was called Death of the Giants, and it was essentially five elephants in India uh, that were found dead in a riverbed. One was pregnant, by the way, and this led to an international investigation, which brought them to myself and Professor Ian Jandrell, the head of electrical engineering at WITS. And we went through all the documents and um, we found out that they died from lightning. Um, fascinatingly enough, in India, these elephants are not like gods, they are gods. And these villagers wanted to kill the park owners. And in us determining that it was lightning, we probably saved the park owners' lives uh, by determining that this was lightning that killed their elephants and not uh, poison, etc. Incidentally, the differential diagnosis for a whole herd of animals that dies is generally lightning, hypothermia, or poisoning. Right? But we'll get to that later. But this was from the Tigris Productions National Geographic film called uh, Death of the Giants, if you can get your hands on that. This happened in Fentersdorp, actually, um, in a small town called Reis Meers Bilt Severald. This tree was struck by lightning, and at the base of the tree, 189 kestrels found dead. They were taken to Onsterpoort and examined by Prof. Zephny uh, Burnett, that's her. Incidentally, none of the birds showed macroscopic evidence of injury. However, if you take uh, infrared and UV light and you look under the microscope, you'll see some singeing of feathers. So sometimes one has to look very carefully for the signs of lightning. Is this in order so far, Peter? Is the slides progressing okay and can you hear me okay? We can hear you fine. Slides are good, thank you. Excellent. It's, all right, let us proceed. So how does lightning attach to its victim? So there are basically five, six or six ways. But, uh, um, and you can see direct strike is this. So if you get hit by lightning directly, that's only about three to 5% of the time. But most of it is side flash or ground current, but I'll get to this now now. <clears throat> so the first way lightning can get you is what's known as the first mechanism of injury, and that is direct strike. Now, folks, this is probably the quickest way you can die. On, on planet Earth. I think th this is probably the way to go. Like you won't hear it, you won't see it, you won't feel it. You, you, it's one of the quickest deaths you can possibly have. You are injected with millions of amps and billions of volts. You won't hear it, you won't see it. Um, you, you'll drop like a sack of potatoes. It's one of the quickest deaths you can possibly ever have. And what does the body look like when you find that body? Well, fascinatingly enough, it looks like a bomb went off next to that body. The shoes blow off, the clothes blow off. So it looks like the person's been exposed to a bomb. And that's the first mechanism of lightning injury. And this only happens three to 5% of the time. All right, moving on. The second way lightning can get you is what's known as the second mechanism of lightning injury. And this is if you are touching something metal. So if you are touching something and lightning surges through that, you've got entry and exit points. This is the second mechanism of lightning injury. And here's a photo of it. This woman was on her corded phone. <clears throat> and these uh, lesions on her skin are called Lichtenberg figures. And she survived. But lightning went through the corded phone to her right ear to the chest. And that's Lichtenberg figures. Okay, A fascinating phenomenon, which I'll get to now now. The third way lightning can get you is what's known as the side flash or the side splash. So here lightning hits a tree and then some of the energy gets dumped on the tree and the other energy flashes off the tree onto the person or the animal. And here's a case that happened uh, with the third mechanism. This happened in Pretoria on the 12th of January at the Pretoria Zoo between 1 and 3 a.m. The next morning there were two dead bongos in the enclosure and a clinical veterinarian, Dr. Tordoff and myself, went to the scene. So that tree was struck. Okay, this is two-thirds up the hill of the zoo. Here's the enclosure from the south side. And there's the signs of lightning on the tree. You can see that. You've got to look very, very carefully. But that's the lightning on the tree. And at the base of the tree, two dead bongos. 
These are Trachelopha species. And you can see there's a plume of froth at the nostrils of the one animal, which tells me that death wasn't immediate. It still had some one or two breaths and whipped up the proteinaceous fluid into like egg meringue. And the one horn is about five centimeters deep in the ground. There was nothing on the fur. Um, and they were killed. They were like 300,000 rand each. And um, my colleague, uh, Dr. Mike Grant, wrote a paper for the International Conference of Lightning Protection on a lightning protection of critically endangered species. So, so that came of this. <clears throat> the fourth way lightning can get you is what's known as earth potential rise. This is the reason why whole herds of animals get decimated by lightning. So you can see this guy's foot, the, the right foot's at a million volts and the left foot's at half a million volts. So there's a potential difference which drives the current through between the legs. So it's like ripples on the surface of the water. And this is why you get whole herds of animals decimated by lightning. Take a look at these photos. This, by the way, uh, are my Kruger photos um, that I managed to track down. Um, this happened, uh, um, sorry, this, this is not Kruger, this was in another um, national park. But here is the Silver Fist Dam incident photo that I got. So there were 60 dead uh, buffalo in this incident. I had heard about it and I managed to, through Ranger Louis Ulefier, track down this singular photo. Um, there was very minimal signs on the buffalo, but on the, one, on the feet you could see some singeing of hair. Uh, which made us think that you know, it's lightning. But this is a very famous, it's one of the biggest um, animal deaths in South Africa, the Silver Fist Lightning Dam incident in Kruger National Park. And then there's the fifth mechanism of lightning injury. This was uh, invented or discovered by Prof. Ralph Anderson. And he worked out that as lightning is coming down, there's like an upward streamer coming up off an object or a person. And here is the very first ever photograph in National Geographic of an upward streamer. You can see the trees being struck by lightning. And if you look to the left of your screen, there's a pole. And off that pole is an upward streamer. Peter, can you see that? Yes, we can. Excellent. Okay, so that's the upward streamer mechanism. And one of the biggest cases in the country uh, that caught the imagination of the public with the upward streamer mechanism was this case, which happened, uh, it was published in 2002 in the Annals of Emergency Medicine called a large group of children struck by, by, by lightning. And what happened was, this happened in the small town of Modimole, known formerly as Nailstrom. It happened on the 11th of November, 1994. That's almost over 20 years ago at 2.30 a.m. in the morning. So what happened was, there were 26 girls. Uh, they were from a school called uh, St. Catherine School from Johannesburg. And they were 10 and 11 years old. They were two adults and seven dogs. And they went to a, a long weekend school trip called Bush Pigs. <clears throat> there was no rain in the vicinity for months. All the girls were sleeping outside and a light rain started. And they moved into this 10 by 5 meter tent. And they were all disorganized, sleepy and jumbled. And at 2.30 a.m. Uh, there was uh, four strokes of lightning. So if you look at the tent and where the girls were, you can see four girls died. And... Uh, um, the dogs also died. Um, you can see where the pole was struck, the pole on the left, it's his stricken 3.6 meter pole. And I actually sat with Rolf Anderson and he showed me the tent and he showed me the pole that was struck by lightning. So, and the reason uh, these girls and these dogs died uh, was because of the fifth mechanism of lightning injury. So it struck that pole and sparks went up off those dogs and off those girls and connected to that pole. Um, when I was talking at Science Fest Africa, one of the girls, Bridget, told me she was in position X and she had a dog over her head and a camera between her legs and the camera held the charge and the dog died. But I think the camera saved a lot because the camera held most of the charge. And then we tracked down all these girls 19 years later. Um, they've, many have immigrated. Their stories are very tragic and um, um, almost 19 years later, we did a follow-up study of these children um, that were struck by lightning. So uh, this, this uh, it was meticulously uh, documented by the CSIR, by Marianne Cooper, Ralph Anderson, and Cart at the time. They they drew everything. They 
examined the girls. It was fantastic science. And yeah, we, we tracked these girls down 19 years later. And many of them have got problems now. Like some have got cataracts and neurological problems. But I'll, I'll go into that later. But we followed them up after about 20 years. And uh, we, we tracked them down. So fascinating story with the fifth mechanism. Incidentally, this happened in Whitbank, also a tent incident. Um, this happened, uh, I think, in, uh, the, about six years ago. And here, seven people died in this incident. <clears throat> Lightning struck this tent in Whitbank. And then another fifth mechanism, sorry, we're just discussing the fifth mechanism here, happened in 1998. And what happened was these soccer players uh, went to ground and no one died. Uh, it happened um, in the afternoon at 4.30 between Morocco Swallows and Joma Cosmos at Johannesburg Stadium. But lightning struck a pole and fifth mechanism connected and took these people down. But they survived. And then there's my PhD. I did it on the sixth mechanism, which is lightning explosive barotrauma. And the case that um, alerted me to the possible existence of this phenomenon happened in Esteris. Uh, there was a, a woman with her two children and the tree was struck, third mechanism. So a lot of the energy dumped on the tree and then it splashed off the tree and hit the pavement. And this pavement caused an explosion. So the two children survived, but the, the woman died and I did the autopsy on the woman. But this was the tree, I went to the scene and uh, this was immediately after the incident. You can see the police tape there. And then on the ground, that was the signs of lightning. I mean, if you're walking down the street and you see this, you'd probably walk straight over it. But these are the signs of lightning. You've got to seek them out. You've got to know what they do. It caused the concrete to explode. Um, and it caused shrapnel injury, secondary missile formation injury on her legs. So the concrete was embedded up to two to three millimeters deep in her legs from this. And I worked out this must be like an explosion. And then I went into the sixth mechanism of lightning injury. It took me eight years uh, to work out the pressures caused by lightning around the, the luminous channel. So lightning is very beautiful, very dangerous, lasts milliseconds. But how does it injure you? So the purpose of this presentation, because, oh, sorry, folks, that was just my introduction. So I hope you're comfortable now, because now we're going to step up a gear and um, take this to the next level, if I may, and show you how lightning actually hurts and injures people. Is that in order, Peter? Go for it. Okay, I hope you've got a strong drink. Um, the photos should be all right here. I'm just test driving this. I'm giving a similar talk on Saturday to junior honorary rangers. So uh, I'm just seeing tonight what works and what doesn't work. But let us kick off proceedings by showing you how lightning hurts people. So there's four main components. There's the light, there's the heat, there's the electricity, and the barotrauma. And these four components is what hurts you. So the light of lightning. And it is so blindingly bright that, I mean, it, the first organ that will be injured is the eye. So if ever you're out in the field and there's a lightning strike, well, you just want to keep that eye wet and closed. Okay, And it can cause a, ho a host of, of eye injuries. So there's acute injuries, there's a host of them, but the most mysterious one is three months later. Three months later, they develop cataracts. And there's many theories as to how this happens, but people think that the extreme light um, interacts with the crystalline lattice, the protein lattice of the lens of the eye, injures it, and then three months later, they develop cataracts. <clears throat> and this doesn't only happen in humans, I've also found cases where it's happening cattle and even a horse. Then there's the heat component. I mean, lightning is so hot, there's a fire hazard, but it, it's too short a time span. So you need like an extreme uh, amount of time before something can catch a light. So um, before it can take fire, inflammable material has to be heated to its ignition temperature. And it does cause burns on humans, <clears throat> but it's more like a singe burn and these generally uh, may be inches long and follow the long axis of the body you may get a smell of singeing or burnt hair all right people always tell me they can smell ozone but that's a myth firstly ozone doesn't smell like anything and it's in the ozone layer and it scorches hair and there's been even reports in the literature of hogs which have been caught a light 
due to lightning. So it generally causes um, superficial singeing uh, of um, uh, on the body. By the way, that's the most common brand of underwear, just um, FBC uh, in, in, at Mortuary. And sometimes we see melting of synthetic material. And even in animals, you may get singeing of, her, of fur. And sometimes you have to really take a magnifying glass and look because you see this almost cindering on the clothing. And, and if you, I mean, this looks like a cigarette injury, but you've got to really take a good look and, and seek these things out. This was a case of fraud, by the way. Um, this one individual said that lightning struck his kayak and he claimed for it from insurance. <clears throat> but we, we, did, uh, we tested for accelerants and we got the lightning data. And um, yeah, this, he, th there was petrol or some carbon fluid that, uh, you know, so he couldn't have his kayak and eat it too. This was a case of fraud. Try to blame lightning, but he set his own kayak alight, by the way. Then there's the electrical components of lightning. So it, it, it messes with your brain. You get a whole host of um, electrical injuries in the brain, which I'm not going to go into. But one of the most fascinating things, which I think um, this audience will appreciate, and I'm going to explain for the very first time to the public how these things happen, because I think we've got an idea how this happens now in science. But on living victims of lightning, you get what's known as Lichtenberg figures. These have been described uh, for uh, decades and centuries, actually. So it looks like you've been slapped with a, with a wet tree fern. You've got this almost fractal graphic type vital reaction. So it looks like this. On lightning strike survivors, very difficult to see on dark colored races. But you get this feathering, this arborescent pattern on the skin. It is, it is fascinating and it disappears um, within three to six hours. And you want to hear the latest thinking in the literature and amongst uh, you know, the, the lightning intellectuals of the world as to how this happens. Okay, here goes. <clears throat> so they think like lightning flashes over the body and there's an interaction between the electrical charge of the lightning and the iron in the hemoglobin of the red blood cells. And it causes the vessels to dilate and you, it follows an electron avalanche uh, pattern. And you get this fractal graphic like um, pattern due to lightning. And these are called Lichtenberg figures, first described by George uh, Lichtenberg. So fascinating. And then you get these unusual spark lesions. So this was a survivor from the Whitbank tent incident. He survived, but take a look at that weird lesion. It's almost like a tendril of lightning splashed onto his arm and you get this delayed shaped pattern with melted keratin so if you feel it with a glove um it almost feels like a melted keratin and it's delayed shaped it's star shaped so and then yeah once people get struck by lightning they're not the same and uh, they have personality changes and we've got a whole lot of criteria to determine if someone has got what's known as post electric shock or post lightning shock syndrome and then there's the blast uh, component of lightning. So around lightning is a pressure wave. It's called the sixth mechanism of lightning injury. I did my PhD on this. And it's like a bomb went off next to the person. And obviously this exists because you can hear thunder from up to 25 kilometers away. So you're dealing with a significant amount of pressure. And this pressure explodes eardrums all right sometimes that's all we find a burst eardrum uh, so to burst an eardrum you need about 29 pounds per square inch and to burst uh, like a lung you need about um, 72 pounds per square inch and to disrupt a human you need about 100 pounds per square inch but we don't see disrupted humans so we think that this pressure wave must be under 100 psi but it does blow off clothing and leather so, I mean, you can imagine how much force it takes to tear a boot. I mean, and lightning does this. There's several theories. There's the flash vapor moisturization theory. Some people say the sweat dissipates. And then there's my blast wave theory. And then even when we do the autopsy and we take away off the breastbone, the sternum, you find bubbles behind the sternum called pneumomediastinum. 
and the alveolar rupture. So this blast wave bursts and explodes the lung and you get these bubbles behind the sternum in lightning. And we only see that in bomb blast and in drowning, strangely enough, as forensic pathologists. And then there's complications. If you survive the strike, you can die later. So if you're lying in hospital, um, you can die from kidney failure or heart failure or multiple organ failure. This was a 10-year-old girl that uh, got struck by lightning and she was lying in hospital and died 10 days later. And then when I cut the heart open, there was hemorrhage in the heart. So the lightning must have gone through her heart. <clears throat> so which brings me now to my closing messages for this. Um, because we're honorary rangers, we also uh, need to educate as we go along. So how do, what do we do about this? So for example, in the USA, they take their lightning very seriously. Um, you'll be traveling and you'll see a, a billboard that says when thunder roars go indoors, one strike and you're out. Or you'll see a billboard saying lightning kills, play it safe. Um, but these are the rules of lightning. So plan your outdoor activities to avoid thunderstorms. Listen to the weather station. There's the 30-30 rule. If the time between lightning and thunder is 30 seconds or less, um, you're at risk, and then stay inside for at least 30 minutes after the last rumble. That's called the 30-30 rule. What is a safe shelter? Well, that's any in fully enclosed metallic surface area, so a car is brilliant. Indoors, stay away from anything connected to power. So cell phones are fine, but a corded phone is not fine. And outdoors, um, try to stay away from high open places. All right. But now, there's a lot of myths with lightning. Every culture has got their myths. Some people say if they're wearing Nike running shoes, they're fine. But rubber does not protect you from lightning. Lightning laughs at two inches of rubber. It will go right through the shoe, and it's called a tiptoe sign. Metal does not attract lightning, so whether you've got an umbrella or not, it will get you with or without the umbrella. Whether you've got your cell phone, it will get you with or without your cell phone. And the rain is not as dangerous as lightning. So... When a safe location is not nearby, is what do you do? <clears throat> so do not seek shelter under tall, isolated trees. You've seen that from the bongos. Do not seek shelter under partially enclosed buildings. I've seen deaths due to that. You've got to know the weather patterns of your area. You must know the weather forecast. When you're going camping, tents offer no protection from lightning. So get out your tent and get into your car. If you're a mountain climber, Wet ropes make excellent conductors. So try to get to the other side of the mountain. Stay away from uh, and wait under an overpass. Look for a bridge. If you find ESCOM wires and they are present, seek shelter directly underneath these wires. That's probably one of the best places to be. Not by the poles, but under the wires. And then some people say, uh, like motorcyclists, move away from your bikes. But I think that's a bit hectic. Uh, off-roaders, get into your car. And remember, these are last resort. You're not safe in these places, just marginally safer than in the open. And we've written a lot of guidelines for, um, I don't know if you realize, but the last couple of rugby games in this country have been stopped uh, due to weather. And that was due to myself and Prof. Gendrell's guidelines, SARU guidelines, the South African Rugby Union guidelines, which you can find on Smart. But we said basically that if a thunderstorm is within 20 kilometers of the game, then the lightning umpire must put the game on high alert. And if the storm is within 10 kilometers of the game, the game stops. And I know this is not convenient, but it is still less convenient than a dead or injured player. So the guidelines can be read um, on the Book Smart website. So that's uh, where you'll find what to do. And please, this is not just for rugby. You can use this for your swimming goalers, hockey, tennis, um, you know, whatever sport you're doing, just cross out the word rugby and take a look at the book smart guidelines. It gives you excellent advice uh, what to do in a thunderstorm. And there's a lot of apps out there. And, you know, I can't tell you which app is better than which other app. But if you're dealing with the lightning, Earth Lightning Protection uh, Expert, there must be ELPA, Earth Lightning Protection Association accredited. So, um, so folks, I think I've, I've said enough here. Um, the eight-part um, series on on people's weather.
gave quite a bit of data, but this is just a summary of all eight episodes. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Prof. There's only one word that I can say, and it's fascinating. It's uh, and one didn't I didn't realize that there was such a a huge amount of different ways that the lightning operates on. Uh, I always just thought it comes from the top and uh, gets you at the bottom. Um, Prof, we've got quite a few questions that has come in. I first want to just handle the ones that uh, members have sent in on our uh, our email. And just before I say, just remember that uh, the booklets will be available from Peter. Peter indicated that he will send the booklets to everyone that has registered for tonight, so it is available. Um, and then for Ashley, who's asked the questions about the swimming pool, and you have kindly also given her two articles that uh, we'll forward to you, Ashley, as well as the other answers for us given in, uh, in the presentation for the weather apps and uh, Hopefully, your answers on the indoor swimming pool, etc., would be answered. Then, Chris the Brainer, I've been told that just before being hit by lightning, your hair stands on end. If you begin to feel your hair standing up, is there any way to measure you could possibly take at that moment to avoid being hit by lightning, such as jump, getting in the car, of rubber wheels, etc.? Okay, that is a very excellent question, and it has been very well described. Uh, you get what's known as St. Elmo's fire. Um, so we see it on ship's masts. So um, they talk about sparks coming off your head and off the back of your neck. Um, if you're in that situation, um, it's, a, it's quite a tough situation. And we've discussed this at length uh, amongst the lightning uh, groups. Some people say you should block your ears. You know, obviously you get ruptured eardrums. You want to if it's raining, you want to be wet because if you're wet, you get flash over. If you dry, you die. You want to crouch down, make as small area areas possible. Um, but you know, these are very last minute. Um, you know, this is really when the coolest dirty cat can <laughs> block ears, crouch down and pray to God and hope for the best. Because these, these, are, these are milliseconds. Yeah, it's... But people have talked about these sparks coming off people and the hair rising, et cetera. And you know, we see it on ships, masts, St. Elmo's fire, it's called. Thank you. Um, Zandra tells us, ask, could you please ask Ryan to include the discussion in the program about people's weather. It was about vultures not feeding for several days on a carcass of a giraffe that was stuck by lightning. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can... I can forward that brief clip uh, to you folks, but we published this in Vulture magazine. So it was a farm up in Palavora, um, and there were big five animals on the farm. And they've, I mean, I know the farm owners quite well. And there were incidences, for example, where hippos were struck and killed by lightning. And within hours, these carcasses were um, scavenged upon. And yet they had an incident with a giraffe that was struck. and. I mean, the, the, the scavengers found this animal immediately, but none of them fed on it until six days later. So we just found this delayed post-mortem scavenging phenomenon fascinating because whenever I've talked around the country, farmers would come up to me with this. Uh, they, they would tell me about delayed post-mortem scavenging. And I, I always took it as a myth. So I didn't know if this was real or not. But then we had our very first witness that we could militaristically... Um, observe we tried not to have too much human interaction um and we try to watch as uh, you know scientifically as possible and it got published in vulture magazine and then we did a little clip on it on people's weather which i can try and forward to you but if that, I, I think if you google um lightning guilty or not people's weather you'll find the lightning the vulture um, clip thank you Right, we're going over to the questions and answers page. Marty Jasper, Ryan, how do you measure the length of the lightning bolt? Okay, this is the realm of the electrical engineer. And I mean, there's conferences called ICLP, the International Conference of Lightning Protection, and there's ICOLSA, and you get meteorologists and climatologists. You know, and we've got an entire lightning network detection system in South Africa and internationally. Um, there's big companies such as Weissela. I mean, each uh, um, detector costs over a million rand. There's, I think, 19 detectors in South Africa, one in Swaziland, 
And you cannot believe the amount of information you can get from a single lightning stroke. They can send you how many amps, they can geolocate it to within a meter and a half. They can tell you what's happening above the clouds, below the clouds. The science of lightning is a whole field in and of itself. I'm just an end user, and that's just the human or the animal body. So I'm, I'm a, that's, that's where I fit in, but they can tell you so much information from, from the, the science. Thank you. And then Heather asks, is there an app that can be downloaded to assist us and track lightning while we're out in the wilderness? Yeah, there's a lot of apps out there. Um, but as I mentioned before, um, you know, I'm, I'm not here to advertise any specific app. But, um, if you do get a lightning expert come to your home or your farm or, you know, and they want to set up lightning conductors, then you want to see that they are ALPA accredited, Earth Lightning Protection Association. Uh, and you can, I've got, I gave the website, ALPA. Um, as long as they're accredited, then like, that's the way to go. Thank you. Then Richard Jones says, if you find yourself in water, is it safer to float instead of stand? Yeah, well, um, for my one textbook, um, which is the Madea's Handbook of Forensic Medicine, I wrote the lightning and electropathology chapter. And one of the big topics in forensic medicine is electrocution in water. So electrocution in the bathtub. And for us to um, answer that question, we had to look at all the literature about from underwater welding to electrical shocks from knife fish, you know, because you get these electric eels to the James Bond, you know, um, where they threw the electrical fan in the bath. Is that myth or is that real um, electrocution in the bathtub? So electrocution in, in water, basically, you need to be grounded to be killed. So if you are floating in the water like a whale or a fish, there's no potential difference. But if you're in the bath and your foot is resting on a chrome tap or your hand is resting on the ground, uh, you're at risk of electrocution. So as long as you are standing or grounded, you're at risk of electrocution. But if you're floating in the water, you should be fine. And incidentally, underwater welders, I don't know if there are any underwater welders here, but um, they say you should weld at high tide not at low tide, because if it's low tide, the salinity of the water increases and you've got a greater chance of a shock. So you actually want to weld underwater at high tide when the salinity of the water is less. Sure, thank you. Fascinating. Fascinating. Right, then we've got a question from Hippo um, Soridis. He says, how does ground to cloud lightning happen? Okay, once again, this is the, the physics of lightning is a whole different uh, um, lecture. You're going to have to get a lightning physicist to come uh, speak with you. It, it, is, it affects every industry on earth, you know, from the photovoltaic volts to the wind um, turbine energy production to weapon caches, you know, you, you mining to civil aviation to agriculture, you know, Lightning affects all industries on Earth and even every human on Earth. I mean, and, and just to answer, like, you, you cannot believe how many people were touched by this lightning pathologist series. I mean, uh, it, it really um, touched people. But, uh, but it is such a massive field. You know, it, the physics of lightning is an, it's a discipline in and of itself. So remember, I'm an end user, pathologist, dead body. That or injured body. That's <laughs> that's where I'll stop my, my commentary. Eh? <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, Jackie Bardlow says, as a Western Cape resident now for many years, we've noticed the number of lightning or the thunderstorms increasing in the past approximately fifteen years. Is there any? Okay, once again, this is for the climatologist, and um, can I can I, I will just end with one last little anecdote. Um, because it's already seven o'clock here, but I was sitting at this international conference of lightning and static electricity, and I was sitting with some of the top lightning uh, experts in the world. And it was late at night, it was uh, BC before COVID, and we were all around the table, uh, inebriated, it was late at night, and I leaned over to this, um, Professor Holler was his name, he's like one of the top lightning uh, measuring guys on the, on the planet, he works for Weissler. And I said, Prof Holler, 
tell me it just level with me give it to me straight climate change is it real is it not real how much trouble are we in um what, what do i need to know this was 12 at night there was copious amounts of uh, alcohol involved and i believe he gave me the most realistic answer that i've heard to date and this is what i'll leave you with tonight he says my boy the weather is the weather climate is what we predict the weather is what we get and on that note, I thank you, folks.